All right. Things that over, overexcite one one's mind, body, and emotions should be avoided. Okay, overexcite. While the soft melodies of good, good music are soothing, there are others that are meant to rouse lust and violence. They have a disturbing effect on one's nerves. Good books instruct and educate, while books with outrageous and sensual content corrupt and alter one's moral values for the worse. Principled conversations uplift whereas vulgar ones debase one's character. Steer clear of the wave of indignity that has taken a hold of people and the world. Yeah. So, let's elevate our thoughts as we feel this connection with the Creator right now and the Good Spirit. As we want to say thank you for the opportunity of being here in peace, surrounded by your love and your guidance. We welcome everyone here present in flesh and in spirit. As we ask the mentors of this house to bless our speaker of this morning, inspiring her and opening our minds and our hearts to the beautiful teachings that we are about to hear. Thank you, dear Lord. Thank you, Christ, for life and for all the teachings. In your name, so be it. Amen. So thank you for the opening prayer. Good morning, everyone. Good morning for the ones who are watching us. Today, uh, we are going to talk about nonviolent communication. Nonviolent communication was founded by Marshall Rosenberg. And he founded this language, this way of communicating, in order to bring something practical for us. And so we would be able to learn how to communicate with the language of love. So I believe that if Jesus was here, he would have blessed, and I'm sure he was, Marsha was inspired by the good spirits to bring this language to us. And if, you know, had this language been available to, you know, 2022 years ago, I'm sure Jesus would have taught us. But I believe we weren't ready to learn that language at that time. So the, then, of course, the, te the teachings come as we are ready to learn. And so, why do you believe that is important to learn nonviolent communication? And you can answer. To inspire peace. To inspire peace. Yeah, I think for understanding our feelings, right? When we express ourselves, this is a violation of communication because we have a violation inside us. To express our feelings. Mm -hmm. To be aware of different kinds of communication. To be aware of different kinds of communication. So you are all on the right track. So as I was thinking about this topic and really reflecting about the type of communications that we have nowadays, in this modern era we are surrounded and like really taking over all so much violence. There is violence in the media, in the movies we watched, in the social media, their violence in the news, the focus is actually through the news is to replicate like violence and uh, create fear. So it's easy for us to really let the violence and the way of being violent be normalized. So what I wanted us today, and I, what I'd like for you guys to take out of this lecture today, is to reflect on types of violence and how you are violent. And you might say, but I'm not violent. But you will realize throughout this lecture on how, yes, we do have violence inside of us, and we do communicate violently. It's not the physical violence that we communicate, 
that we do it, but it's some other types of violence. So it's important that we don't normalize violence because then as you normalize things, you accept violence throughout your day and you accept as normal and that's not how we're supposed to be. We also have to understand the difference between big acts of violence and small acts of violence, right? It's easy for us to get uh, shocked and moved with when big acts of violence happened. It just happened recently, everybody is aware here in the United States, for the ones who live here and uh, remember what happened in the school a couple of weeks ago, the shooting. This actually, this past weekend, there was a mass of march, march for our lives, uh, protesting against gun violence. So when those big acts of violence happen, it touches us and moves us. And then we want to do something about it, we want to act, which is, that's what we should do. We should, you know, we should protest and we should do anything in our power in terms of advocacy to go against these big acts of violence. But here is the question. How do big acts of violence start? <clears throat> Can someone answer to me? Inside our hearts, maybe? Yes. Inside of our hearts, past experience. Where do they originate? So I want you to think about this, the difference. So between big acts of violence and small acts of violence. Think about this phrase. Big acts of violence are born within millions acts of small violence. They're, they just don't happen isolated. Oh yeah, one day one person decided to do this. It's, it's a lifetime of accruing small acts of violence, right? And so, do you think about it like, where are those big acts of violence and where are those small acts of violence? The small acts of violence are within your home, they are within your families, your communities, your uh, schools, your churches. They are within us and they are in the way we talk, they are in the way we act with one another, they are in the way we are being with each other. So. Let's think about how can we shift that and who was the person and, and spirits that were really role models of the opposite of that. They were the role models of peace and the role models of acts of kindness. And of course there are many and the ones who we are connected and study is Jesus. And we're going to talk about Jesus today, but there was Gandhi. There was Buddha and, you know, Madre Teresa. Those are the people who, choose in, who chose in their lives, right, to have constant acts of kindness and really fighting against nonviolence ways of being. So let's think about Jesus then and think about how Jesus communicated 2,022 years ago. Reflect about that and when I ask those questions that I'm gonna about to ask, I want you to think about yourself. I want you to think about how you communicate. So let's think about Jesus, like did he use any act of violence to communicate what he wanted? Did he impose his teachings to the ones that weren't following his guidance? Did he offend the ones who displayed a different opinion than his? Did he feel offended by the ones who made fun of his teachings, who put him down, who patronized him? Did he react violently? I'm sure we all know the answer to those questions and the answer is no. How Jesus showed his message Jesus simply made use of stories to communicate, metaphors, 
to bring his messages along. These messages of nonviolence, they were embedded in his stories. And although he explained some, some of their meanings, the comprehension of this mes his message was they were really left for people's own understanding and thinking. He didn't impose the meaning of the messages or the lessons. Do you know why? Because he knew that we see the world of who we are and not how the world is. He knew that we see the world of, with our eyes of who we are. It doesn't matter what he said. We're gonna, we have the lenses and we're going to see the world according to who we are. So in order for him to be effective with his teachings, he showed actions. Not only talking and, you know, giving the message, but he showed actions. When he wanted to show he was against any discrimination, what did he do? He went and ate with Simon the leper. He went and ate and was at the house with the tax collectors that, you know, were really, uh, people were prejudiced against them at that time. He was kind and stood for and respectful towards women at, at that time, you know, in front of the most rigid men that were at that time. And when he was at the peak of his popularity, when you know he, his ego probably could raise up for being popular, he entered the city of Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, right? So see how Je it makes me emotional to think about that, because it's there for us the example, which makes us think about and how we have to act, and the, the only thing we're gonna be able to teach our kids and teach our next generations in terms of nonviolent communication and nonviolent ways of being is by being nonviolent. It's by being kind. So Jesus used the language of love. He came to teach us the importance of loving one another at the time where was the law, the eye for eye, tooth for tooth. He was extraordinary. He, he came to bring this huge, break this huge paradigm. So, and all those messages and the stories and these metaphors, they were a love road map that we can testify by reading the gospel. It, it starts by love your neighbor as yourself and do to others what you'd like have them done to you. Chapter 11 of the gospel. Chapter 12. Return goodness for evil. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him to, and give the other as well. And I want to stop on that one and give you a little explanation because that's a really violent act, right? That is common. Being physically hit on your right cheek and then Jesus coming at that time where there was the law, you know, you do this, you, you get that. And he's saying no. You give the other cheek. And what, did, what does that mean? So I brought this book, and I like to bring my books in my lectures. This book here from August Kuritz, I don't think it's translated, translated but it's called Masters, Masters of Masters. And um, he studies the intelligence of Jesus Christ at his time. And he says about this passage, of the giving the other cheek. He says, the psychology behind the sentence, give your other cheek, protects the person who has been violated physically or emotionally. Why? Because it takes two to tango, doesn't it? If you hit me and I hit you back, I am on the same level as you are. If I give the other cheek, doesn't mean I'm like being there for you to hit, keep hitting me. No, what he meant is, if I don't respond at the same level that you do, if I, rise, if I really rise above you, then I am being protected emotionally because I am not responding at the same level that you are. And then that, what, it, what does that do? 
It incites the intelligence of the violent person, encourages them to think and recycle their violence. Because the violence is kept on their ground, in, on their court. The game didn't start, it didn't happen. It stayed on their court. It was that, that conflict was avoided. So it makes the person who actually hit or offended think about what they did. And why is it important that they think about what they did? They recycle that thought. They realize that violence is actually a sign of fragility. A person who is violent is a person who has no power. I want you to think about that. A person who is violent is a person who is, has no power and hides themselves with, behind that violence. And Jesus showed us real power, that real power lives where? In tolerance, in humility, in all acts of goodness, and more in the capacity of helping others to become aware and conscious of their internal <clears throat> world and reality. So whenever you get offended next time, I want you to think about that. That the act of you stopping that offense and leaving it on the court of the person who offended you, it's creating the ability, helping that person to reflect on their act of violence. And that's very, very important. Why? Because Jesus wanted to teach us how to become self-aware. We need to think about what we do. The only way to transform ourselves is to know who we are, self-awareness. You cannot change what you don't see. You need to know what's inside. So think about how violent you are throughout this lecture in, in order for you to change that. And through his parables, as I mentioned before, you know, in Jesus' teachings, he invited everyone to begin that journey. He listened more than he spoke. If you look at the gospel, you know, the stories are that short. He listened more than he spoke. He asked more questions than gave answers. Because when you ask questions, and I'm asking you a question, and you have to reflect. That's the power and that's the, uh, of asking questions. That's the power of Jesus' intelligence and capacity to make people learn in that way. He encouraged people to go within and really begin reflecting about their emotional motives and actions. Because that's the only way you're going to change if you know what's inside. So now that we know how important it is to become self-aware, right? let's observe when we are violent and why. And so ask yourself, and you don't need to answer publicly. When I become violent, and it might say, but I'm not really physically violent. But as I mentioned before, that's not the only type of violence that exists. Let's say in communication, for example, passive aggressiveness is a type of violence. Threatening other people to get them to do what you want them to do is a type of violence. Labeling people is a type of violence. Blaming, guilt tripping, coercing by fear, all these ways of being are type of violence. And there, there's a long list, but we can have another lecture to <laughs> work on those things. But why we choose that? Why we become violent? Why we label, we threaten? Why we enter conflicts? And as Jesus said, the two evils of this world, selfishness and pride. In the chapter 11 of the Gospel, Pascal, in 1862, explains, and I'm going to read it to you, so listen. Selfishness is a denial of love. Yet without love, human society would find no rest. To take the matter a step further, nothing would be safe. For if selfishness and pride dominated, and they go hand in hand, life would be a race 
which the winners would always be most cunning. It would be a war of personal interests. Look at our mod modern world today, right? A war of personal interests in which the holiest and most delicate feelings would be trampled underfoot and even family ties would go unrespected. That hasn't changed that much, unfortunately. And why do we do that? Because most of the time, people want to be right rather than happy. I wanted to really get that. People want to be right rather than happy. Have you noticed how many times we lose connections with our loved ones, with our families, co-workers, because we'd rather be right than loved or loved, loved or to love? And why we choose that path? Because our pride and selfishness talk louder, right? Our inflated egos take over until we realize at the end of the day, or maybe at the end of a decade, or at the end of a lifetime, that we are more disliked than right. We can be right as much as we want, but nobody is going to want to be around us if we are that way, and we ended up alone. It's very unfortunate to choose that path, but I want you to think about that every time you really want to be so right. But, so what's the way away from this selfishness and pride that makes us take those, make those choices and take that pathway? And so again, the love roadmap where Jesus came to us to let knows the priority. Chapter 7 of the Gospel say, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Everyone who exalt, exalts himself will be humbled. Chapter 9, blessed are the meek and the peacemakers. Chapter 10, blessed are the merciful. And chapter 10, it says, do not judge or you will to be judged. For the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So... That is the love roadmap in the gospel. Already, you know, we already know all that. Like, what is the way towards humility and love? Is to follow those paths through actions, through example. Chapter 11, chapter 17, which is my chapter the, that I most like in the gospel, is the chapter that gives us the roadmap for self transformation. It's called Be Perfect. For me, it's the manual of self-transformation. If we can actually get one-third of what it says there, and you go home and you read that, it would be amazing. And in that chapter, it, say what it, it says, what is to be a good spiritist? And it says, true spiritists can be recognized by their moral transformation and by the efforts they make to overcome their bad traits. And the only way we do that is by First, first step is by self-awareness, is by knowing what's going on inside of us. And then chapter 13 gives us what we need to be. We need to be compassionate. And compassion is everything. And it says, compassion is far from causing the disturbance and inconvenience of which selfish people are so afraid. So, now we're going to enter on nonviolent communication and the steps that Marshall Rosenberg taught us. <clears throat> and I want you to consider from today as like a, a day that you choose in your communications, compassion over pride and selfishness. And compassion is actually the founding, inspiring concept for nonviolent communication. When uh, Marshall Rosenberg was researching how to create that model, he studied religions. And he studied uh, that every religion said that what you give, you give it from the heart. So he said, what I want in my life is compassion. 
a flow between myself and others based on a mutual giving from the heart. Look how beautiful that is. So in the concept of nonviolent communication, no one can be truly happy at the expense of the unhappiness of the others. So if you are communicating and you want to be right, even if the person says, okay, I agree with you and your needs are met, but the person's needs are not met, you can be happy, but not. Are you really happy at the expense of the unhappiness of others? No, you're not. So the, in nonviolent communication, the needs of others are taken in consideration as much as your own needs. And that's what I'd like you to take today whenever you're communicating. The ability to consider your needs, of course, because that's important, and the needs of others. So in the sense, that's what I said that Marshall Rosenberg brought, like a practical love language that Jesus couldn't teach at that time because people weren't ready for it, but I believe we are ready now, otherwise you wouldn't, that message and this wouldn't have come, is a practical application of the commandments of Jesus, of love, neighbors as oneself, and the golden rule, which is do to others what would you like to be done to you. So I'm going to read in Marshall's language what nonviolent communication is for him. It's a language of life that helps us to transform old patterns of defensiveness and aggressiveness into compassion, empathy, and to improve the quality of all of our relationships. So it has four steps. The first one, when you are communicating, something really always happens, like Right now, what's happening? I'm giving a lecture, you are listening. This is what is happening, is the fact. So your first step is to state concrete actions you observe. That's it. Without judgment, without your lenses of interpretation of it. Second step is state the feeling that that observation is triggering in you. So I'm talking here and Feelings are being triggered by you, to you by what I'm saying, different for each person. See, something is happen. what happens is always a fact. Giving a lecture and you observing the lecture, this is what's happening. Now, what's triggering for each of you is a totally different. So that's why sometimes in a situation, same situation happens to different people and they're experience of the situation, the meaning they put in that situation is completely different. Then the third uh, part is state the need that's causing, that's the cause of that feeling. There's always a need behind the feeling. And the fourth is make a concrete request for action to meet the need just identified. Now, if you want to come get the pamphlets, you're going to turn on page three, and I'm going to give you a practical example of it. There's some here in the front. <clears throat> so you see on the top there, say, when I see that, it's the third page. So on the top right there, this is how it goes. And I'm going to give you an, a, a concrete example that I had a couple clients that I work with. And I will give you an example of what happened. The p one partner was complaining that the other partner had the phone uh, while they were sleeping, was checking emails, uh, you know, before going to bed, work emails. And the complaint went like this. You don't care about me. I'm really upset that you check your emails. That's unhealthy. You shouldn't. You shouldn't do that. Like, do you love me even? Like, it looks like you don't love me. That was the, dis that was the display of their communication. If you hear that, what is your immediate reaction? 
you're going to get defensive, right? Because there is a blaming. There's like, you don't care about me. You, you know, if, if you loved me, you wouldn't be checking emails. Do you see? And we all do that. Now let's translate that fact to how we would learn the nonviolent communication through the four steps. So first, when I see that, you are checking your emails, work-related, right at bedtime. I feel disconnected, sad, and abandoned. abandoned. Because my need for love and connection is not met. And then is the request. Would you be willing to leave your phone at the kitchen or compromise and check it before you enter the room so we can have this bedtime in a special way and it can be sacred for a relationship. Can you tell the difference? Would you feel defensive if this person is communicating in that way? No, because the person is saying what they see. They, they are all in the eye. They are owning what is important to them. Mm. They, are, they are describing what they see, they are saying what they feel, they are describing their need behind that feeling, and then they're making a request. Yes, it's in the other person's hands to answer yes or no, and then it's a conversation, right? But see the difference between being passive-aggressive, which is, you know, blaming and aggressive and and, and there, there is no conversation. This is an opening for compassion and conversation. So I like you have the pamphlet, you have the little handout. I like this is what's taken actually from the, their website. There is an app for nonviolent communication, actually, cost costs $12, but it, it gives you the steps and you put a, like a situation that you're living in. It's really interesting if you are, are interested in, in investing in that learning. I also recommend the book. Uh, and there's even like chapter of like groups that practice this teaching. So in every lecture, I like to leave something practical for you to do. This is my gift to you. Thank you for the lecture today. And now we're going to do our passes.